Hello, my name is Jared Ludlow, Publications Director at the BYU Religious Studies Center, your weekly resource for gospel scholarship. And today I'm joined by Ivy Furman, a student intern, editing intern here at the RSC. And we'd like to share some possible resources that can accompany your Come Follow Me reading for October 28th through November 3rd, Mormon chapters 1 through 6. The first is called Mormon, the Man, and the Message. It's by Richard Holtzoffel, a former religion faculty member here at BYU. It comes from a volume the RSC published called The Book of Mormon, 4th Nephi through Moroni, From Zion to Destruction. And here's a few points he makes. Mormon lived at the close of the Nephite history, around A.D. 310 to 385. And the Book of Mormon bears his name because he was the major abridger, the writer of the gold plates. Mormon's contribution as editor lies in the fact that he assiduously presents source documents and texts while retaining a unity of narrative flow in his historical account. Thus, even while abridging a record, Mormon would paraphrase or summarize and then return to a first-person quotation. And in spite of the wicked state of the affairs among the Nephites, Mormon was able to maintain his beliefs and stand on holy ground, apart from those around him that uh, weren't so righteous. So Ivy, what did you take away from this article? Um, well, as an editor, I really liked the part that talked about his editing. And it said, an examination of the editorial devices used by Mormon shows a sincere concern for the credibility and editorial honesty and a sense of humility while undertaking the prophetic task of preparing um, another witness of Jesus Christ. And as an editor, you really want to make sure that you're true to whoever you're quoting. And I just thought, I mean, he could have changed whatever he wanted, but it's clear that he was humble and really just tried to preserve the record. So I appreciated that. That's a great insight from an editor. <laughs> Thank you. So here's some of his conclusion. Who can estimate Mormon's contribution to the salvation of the modern world? As an apostle of the Lord, Mormon is capable of putting the Savior's ministry among the Nephites in proper perspective. He has an intimacy with the resurrected Lord that few have experienced. He stands as a witness of Jesus and therefore is an example of discipleship in the truest sense. As a father, Mormon's efforts are reflected in the life of his son, Moroni a son whose ultimate mission was seen by John the Revelator. In a most cruel and hostile world, filled with all manner of evil and destruction, Mormon and Moroni wield a living and tender link with the teachings of Christ's pure gospel. As a possible prophetic type, Mormon's life may well have brought understanding to Joseph Smith. Mormon's own experiences may have cast a long shadow into the future, the life of Joseph Smith. As a record keeper, both as Nephite historian and a bridger, Mormon's impact may never really be known. The second article is called Preparing for the Judgment. It's by Gerald Hansen, Jr., a religion political science faculty member at BYU-Idaho, and it comes from the same volume, The Book of Mormon, 4th Nephi through Moroni, From Zion to Destruction. And here's some points he makes. The power of the Book of Mormon to move us closer to God comes largely from the stark contrast of its two main messages. On almost every page, the prophets preach the positive and preeminent message of overcoming the world through hope in Christ. On the other hand, their constant reminder of judgment for the wicked never allows us to relax or be comfortable in sin. These two messages reach their greatest intensity in the nine chapters known also as the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Mormon. The account of the destruction of the Nephites insists that we see the consequences of following the world's enticements instead of God's commandments. As a result, this destruction is not meant to be read just as historical fact, but as a metaphor of judgment, a shadow of the everlasting destruction known as second death. The treachery of seeking wealth can be especially perilous for religious people, he warns, because the outward respectability that comes from the condemnation of wealth and religious devotions can camouflage the need to constantly seek Christ. So he says the antidote to the slow poison of materialism is the Book of Mormon. Ivy, what did you learn from this article? I thought it was interesting how the article pointed out that the Nephites had access to the Jaredite record, of, like a record of, of people falling into wickedness and therefore destruction. And it just made, it kind of prompted readers to think, like, 
do are we taking the Book of Mormon seriously as something that could ultimately happen to us if we aren't righteous and prepared? So I thought that was an interesting insight. Good. So yes, yeah, certainly during the time of Mormon Moroni, they see what happened to the Jaredites mm -hmm. happening to them. And yeah, it's a good exactly. warning to us. I think good. Mm -hmm. like that. Here's some of his conclusion. It is not the intention of the prophets of the Book of Mormon to tell us we are doomed or damned, but rather to awaken us to greater repentance. They long for us to learn how to come to Christ in a world that offers hundreds of counterfeit gospels. They show us in their writings that hoping in Christ is a gift of God reserved for those who know his will and follow his teachings. The third article is called The Author and the Finisher of the Book of Mormon. It's by John Butler, a scientist and a former student of BYU. And it comes from that same volume, The Book of Mormon, 4th Nephi through Moroni, From Zion to Destruction. And here's a few points he makes. In the church, we speak of Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of our faith. This paper examines and compares Mormon as an author and Joseph Smith as a finisher of the Book of Mormon. Perhaps no other prophet personifies the preparation and achievements of, of Joseph Smith better than the prophet Mormon. He was a type for the prophet Joseph, foreshadowing Joseph's life and important mission. And throughout the article he gives many parallels between Joseph Smith and Mormon. Things like his, their heritage, their strength, their leadership. And one other thing he points out that parallels the two of them is from the time that they were called to their ministries, both prophets never ceased to labor. From age 16 to his death, sometime after age 74, Mormon struggled to aid his people militarily and spiritually. Joseph Smith similarly was in the service of God and his people from his teenage years to his death at age 38. I do what stood out to you from this one. What I thought was interesting is it talked, like you said, it talked about comparisons between Mormon and Joseph Smith, and it mentioned how they're both described as large in stature, both, and it kind of talked about how they're large in stature physically, but they are also large in stature spiritually. They're both, that God kind of gave them physical gifts, and they developed their spirituality so that they could be large in stature and spirit. Great. I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah, and even from a very young age, mm -hmm. right, they were seen as having those gifts mm -hmm. and abilities. Good, here's some of his conclusion. No other Latter-day Prophet matches Mormon as well as the Prophet Joseph. Perhaps he possessed many of Mormon's attributes so that he could be more in tune with a compiler of the Book of Mormon as he translated it. Or, as James E. Talmadge put it in his book, The Articles of Faith, the translator must have the spirit of the prophet if he would render in another tongue the prophet's words. The attributes, character, and even many of the activities of Mormon can be considered a type which foreshadowed the future translator. In this manner, the author and the finisher of the Book of Mormon have more in common than just the book which they helped bring forth.